Good evening, everyone. This is Piero San Giorgio. I have the great pleasure to host for the second time uh, Daniele Bolelli. Hello. So, thank you so much for having me. Excellent. So you're uh, still in uh, Los Angeles, California? Yes, indeed. And uh, lots, of, lots of news from your side? Yeah, I'm, um, one of my podcasts, the, my main podcast, History on Fire, I, I just signed with a company called Luminary, which um, what they are trying to do basically is create a Netflix of podcasting. So support content creators more than the free model. Uh, and ask for, I mean, you can, you know, there's an app where you can get all your regular podcasts for free, but then there's also premium content where you listen to um, certain, some podcasts that are exclusive to Luminary. So this is a new way for um, creators, for content creators, to get some revenue. Yeah, because the trick is, here is the problem. There is no single model of podcasting that clearly works. Um, there are a bunch of ways to make it work, but none of them is an obvious issue. Like the free model of podcasting, what we've used so far, works and it doesn't. I mean, especially works if you have, uh, if you do a podcast where you're just doing maybe a few interviews with, uh, you know, the amount of time that you have to invest in it is semi-limited you can afford to take a little more chances. For the kind of podcast that I do, where I have to put maybe 150, 200 hours of research in a month, I can't afford to take a chance. You know, it's like if, if I put that much time into an episode, then uh, I, that means I can't have another job on a regular basis. So it cannot be like, oh, somebody sent you $5 here, $5 there. It, it doesn't happen. And, and, you know, the tricky part is that realistically, the number of people who support free podcasts is always really small. I don't know what happens in your case, but I've noticed for me, maybe 1% of listeners yes. end up supporting. That's, and so that's... that's that <laughs> some... Uh, yeah, it's about uh, it's about one percent, and uh, of, obviously, if you're uh, Joe Rogan, that's okay. Uh, but yeah. um, but if you're uh, one of us Italians trying to make a living, it's uh, it's hard. Yeah, and and you know, it's like I have another podcast, the Drunken Taoist, and that's just a chatty podcast with interviews. That one I can keep for free because even if I'm not making crazy money on it, doesn't matter. It's fine. It's it's fun. It's but it becomes more of a hobby. If you are doing it where you have to invest that kind of time and energy, it needs to pay. And, you know, unfortunately, people have a tendency to complain. You know, if you have too many ads, people complain. If you use Patreon, it's like, oh, no, we don't like Patreon as a corporation. Okay, fine. PayPal, oh, no, I don't want to start a PayPal. It's like somehow at the end of the month, the math needs to add up and it needs to pay for itself or it doesn't work. And, you know, and the offer that Luminary made was good enough that it was like, you know what, it's worth the experiment. Now, and um, find out whether that's a way of the future or it's not. There's only way to find one way to find out. Now, I don't think it's, it is uh, relevant in your case, but is it for many uh, cr content creators also a way to avoid the uh, growing censorship that we see in, uh, on YouTube and other, other platforms? Yeah, I mean, these guys distribute on their own. Right, it's their thing through them. They have put basically no limitation on what I do. So it's been, uh, you know, and again, you know, this has just started. It's a new thing that I'm experimenting with. We'll find out. Okay. You know, of course, you're gonna get, uh, you know, initially people. There are gonna be a lot of people who are gonna resist the idea of paying for something that used to be free. At the same time, you know, if I look at my product, that would have not survived if I have to put that much time and energy into it without a certain level of support. I will certainly put the link in the description. And um, so let's sell that to, our, to my audience. Um, uh -huh. Because I, the reason I wanted to talk to you is because I've been, uh, I've been uh, listening for free. All your, uh, a lot of your uh, podcasts, a lot of the Drunken Taoists, but um, more interesting because I'm, a, I'm a passionate about uh, history. Uh, the history on fire ones, and uh, yep. uh, I found that your style, uh, of course, to to carry, uh, you know, it's it's funny to me because a lot of people tell, oh, history is boring and so on, and for me, it's the most exciting and interesting thing in in the universe. Uh, 
Sure. And you carry it with a lot of passion, with a lot of uh, uh, interesting detail that makes it funny, that makes it uh, relevant, and uh, and you have a very interesting style. I encourage people to go and listen your to your uh, guest now older older yeah. episodes. So, uh, but how how about you telling us, uh, my audience, why it's so important? So history is so important, and 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 what is your uh, history and fire about? Well, to me, history is a way to learn what it means to be human. You know, you have so many examples of values, priorities, ideas, actions that human beings have taken place. If, if, if a human has done it, it's history. You know what I mean? So in that sense, just about everything associated with human beings is history. So what I do is focus on either a character or an event in human history and then dive deep to really give you a feel for who that person was like or what was behind those events. And ultimately, to put you, it's almost like watching a movie. You know, you put yourself in that person's shoes. You see the world through their eyes. You get, uh, so it, at the end, it becomes really an exercise in storytelling where, you know, the history needs to be accurate, of course, that's a given. But then also how you tell that story, you know, it can be the tedious way that they told you history in school or it can be this exciting at the edge of your seat. It feels like you're watching, you know, the coolest show you've ever seen type of thing. And that's the goal of the game, you know, is to make it where you will feel to make it entertaining without sacrificing the accuracy. Now, many, many of the topics are uh, are not very common. I mean, everyone uh, knows about, you know, the moon landing of 1968 right. or whatever. But for example, you have the history of what I, what I think is, is one of the greatest, if not the greatest artist ever, uh, Caravaggio. Uh -huh. yep. And you discover yep. much more than the art. You discover an incredible life and an incredible yep. uh, city of, of where he was living at the time. Maybe, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about, about Caravaggio because I'm sure our listeners don't know. Yeah, I remember I was telling Dan Carlin, who's sort of the master of the historical podcasting genre, I was telling him that one of my favorite podcasts that I've done was the Caravaggio one. And Carlin, I mean, he knew who Caravaggio was, but he was like, hmm, really? That's kind of weird. An Italian painter? I, like, how does that turn into an epic story? And I was like, no, no, no. Forget an Italian painter. Think Tupac at Tupac being a painter in the 1600s rather than a rapper in the 1900s, and you get the Caravaggio story. And Carlin was like, okay, say no more, I got it. I can see why this is a great story. And that's what it is, you know, the Caravaggio story is a story basically of a gangster who's a serious gangster who gets, you know, sentenced to death for participating in a duel and killing a rival, getting into sword fights all the time, drunken brawls in the tavern and in the middle of all that he finds the time to paint the greatest start of the late 1500s early 1600s and so it, the just opposition of him being this amazing artist dining with cardinals one moment and then fighting in the streets with a sword the next moment makes the story rather compelling yes and uh, and you discover that um, life has never been boring. In every yeah. epoch that you are, it's right. never dull, at least, uh, well, I guess he was certainly an exceptional people. Sure. But, you know, we, we, we think Los Angeles is fun, but right. it has been fun in any, any, every major city all the time. It was also brutal. Yeah, that's no, it. It's a, it, it makes it... I remember growing up in Italy. Italian history always seemed really boring to me. And then, oddly enough, is when I moved away and actually started reading books in English about mm -hmm, yeah. Italian history, where I started picking up, it's like, oh my God, this was like Game of Thrones 24-7, you know, it was like, and everything Even today, started uh, becoming much more exciting. In f you're, you, you, what you say is very correct, because even, even living in Switzerland and studying, uh, I study a lot in French as well as in Italian or, or in other languages, but I found that the Anglo-Saxon uh, academics, histor historians, are much less um, ideological uh -huh. and uh, and much more um, in depth than actually uh, many local ones in in many different countries. I find uh, right. 
uh, extremely open-minded and 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 deep knowledge historians about France's history, Italian, German, Russian history uh, in in America and in, in England than you can find in in, in locals and and it, this this is probably um, as you you're, you've been perhaps in the in the academic sector a bit more. Um, is it, is it due to the high quality of the universities that is was at least traditionally uh, the case in the U.S. and, and England, or or, or sure. is it the market that is bigger? I'm not sure. Or it could be that you know, if you are telling a story for people in a country and they are kind of familiar with that story, so you take a lot of stuff for granted and you start nerding out on details. If you have to tell people who have no idea what you're talking about, about a story, you need to bring it back to the elements of why should you care? You know, it's like in Italy, you know, certain topics are you should care because you should care. It's important because it's our history. But that's not a good sell. You mm -hmm. know, that doesn't hook people in. If instead you have to convince people who have no idea why they should care and you have a five minute pitch to convince them this is why it's a big deal. Inevitably, you have to put the accent on stuff that make people excited, that makes people want to read the whole book. So then maybe there may be an element of that too. Yeah, correct. The, um, the, the other, uh, the other perhaps interesting fact about uh, the U.S. is that it is still a culture, at least let's say um, in the generations that are older now. I, I don't know the younger one. Maybe maybe people like you can get younger younger audiences. But people like to read, and sure. uh, the Anglo-Saxon culture, like the Russian, like uh, there are some cultures where people still read a lot, and uh, and uh, and therefore uh, there is a market for for history books and, and historians. The, um, the the you mentioned we mentioned the cities before. One of the one of my favorite of your podcast is the one about the gang of La Maliana in Rome. Yeah. Uh, which is which? Maybe you can tell us a little bit because it's very interesting. I'm I'm researching criminal activity for one one of my future books, and um, and this one is a uh, you know everyone knows the mafia, everyone knows the Drangheta or the the Camorra, but no one knows the ma Roman mafia. Maybe you can yeah, tell us a bit because it's uh, you know it starts out with the criminal underworld in Rome in the early seventies. It's very fragmented. You have you know small bands of criminals, three, four, five people. That's it to do their activities. And what happens is what starts out as a super street gang. You know, a few of these four or five people each who join together in this larger gang. That because it's Rome. And because they start dominating the criminal underworld in Rome just by sheer numbers, they end up hooked up not just with this typical street crime, but they end up hooked up with the, the power gang, end up becoming much more than that, end up becoming a key element tied to major politicians, to the church, to... You know, because of course there's a way to do business legally, and then that's what happens under the table, where both politicians and the church have been involved in a lot of shady deals. And you find the Maliana being their main reference point for this kind of shady deals. And the Maliana thing is funny because I usually tend to find conspiracy theories kind of lazy sometimes. You know, most of it is like, eh, okay, I see why you want to believe it, but there really is no evidence. The Maliana story makes you believe in every other, because, I mean, <laughs> the stuff that you find out there, the, the connections between some of the most important politicians in the late 20th century Italy, the connections with the church, the Vatican, it's like, it makes you go like, come on, that can't be true, except that it's all very well documented and there's plenty of evidence there. Yeah, no, it's a fascinating story. And... Um... You know, the, speaking of conspiracy, I, I don't know if you did a, a show on the, I can't remember, if you did a show on, for example, the use of the American uh, armed forces of the mafia in uh -huh. Sicily to help their landing in, uh, in 1943. And so, so these kind of uh, conspiracies are often very, very, very well documented. And it's just yep. that we, 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 we think they are so obvious that we don't even consider them as, as conspiracies. But uh, I'm right. sure that uh, 10 years after the war, if you, have, if you had said, oh, uh, the U.S. used the mafia to, to help them, they would have, people would have said, no, I mean, come on. Of they would of never course. do something like that. 
<laughs> so that's actually a topic that I haven't tackled, but oh. I want to. It has been on my radar as like, so if you have any good readings or sources you like, please send them yeah, my usually, way. Uh, usually the, the writings of the judges in Italy, uh, the, the few non-corrupt people, like, uh, you know, they, they, di they died for their, for their fight, uh, you know, Borsellino and, uh, and, and, th and those very famous ones. Um, they, 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 their books wrote on, written on them, and they usually, uh, if you check them, they, they, they usually go through the history of, of the mafia, which is, which is a very recent organization. I mean, of course, the roots go back to the typical, sure. um, you know, thugs that were fighting through the Middle Ages, sometimes sure. against the Muslims, sometimes uh, um, for their for themselves, and so on. And do yeah. some small, you know, uh, stealing sheep and and smuggling something. Very little yeah. business, of but course. it's but it's really in the the the, the, the you know in the nineteen forties when when the Americans came that they pushed this thing to become a, a, a really interesting and big organization linked to America. Right. And the American crime, as you know, you know they always say the mafia, but in fact the Italian criminal activities was quite small. Compared to the right. Irish, for example, or the yeah. Jewish, like uh, you know this fa fabulous movie of um, of uh, is it uh, Coppola that made Once Upon a Time in America, fantastic right. movie about the Jewish mafia in New York, or right. or or even um, uh, the, the the native the English mafia, like like right. it shows in Cor Scorsese Gangs of New York, which is yeah. very old and, and and very powerful, and as you said, now it's called the government. <laughs> Right, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and the biggest gang becomes the state, and yeah. um, and 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 so you you have amazing amazing stories, and in Napoli, it's another it's another universe, and you, I think there is the this Italian writer, uh, the name eludes me, but he's very very famous, um, who wrote about the 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 the, the criminal activities in um, like Gomorra and um, yeah. I can't remember the name like that, but he's very famous. Very interesting stories, and um, and this is, by the way, you can do the same in ev almost every country in the world, especially in the Mediterranean. You have this, you have the Turkish mafia, the Albanian, the, you, the Serbian, the Spanish, the, the French, the South of France, the Corsican. The, uh, only in Switzerland we seem to be naive and not not having thought about that. But uh, well, we launder the money, of course. <laughs> by the way, I think it was Saviano. That Saviano. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And um, I'm trying to interview him, but it's hard to get. And, I'm uh, sure. And, and yeah, and, uh, and and the judges are very inter are very interesting. And and and, and as you know, uh, the, these criminal activities, as as you said, indeed, are, are used by governments to do some dirty, dirty uh, political things, including assassinations or sometimes yep. terrorist activities under false flags, if you wish, to to then blame. Some some movement that is that is completely non, non related, and this has happened when the at, at, there there has been some attacks. I, I think you mentioned that briefly in the show in uh, um, in Milano. Was it in Milano? There was this big bomb in Bologna or Bologna. And there, was, there was Piazza Fontana Piazza in Fontana. Milano. There was uh, in Bologna. There was the bombing of the train at the train station. There was there, there was definitely a lot of violence in the late seventies, early eighties in Italian history for sure. And um, and and this is an example why history is, is important. Of course, is that could these things happen again? Of course. Are they happening right now? Well, it does right now. Yes. And so we need to learn. Definitely. No, it's no, it's, and I, that's what uh, makes it. I mean, it, it's you know, it, this is like watching The Godfather to the tenth power. You know, it's like the same thing that makes you watch a fictional movie. There's plenty of real stuff that is as wild and uh, intense as the fiction. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, and and another thing that comes out in your in your um, in your podcast in the series is that you always have this mix of people who want power, people who have huge egos and ambition, and um, sometimes the, and this is what is fascinating is the willpower of one individual. Can change uh -huh. history, sure. And uh, and and do you have some some good examples for our audience of people who, who single-handedly changed history uh, by by the sheer will of power? 
Yeah, I mean, there's a story that I dedicated a lot of um, <clears throat> four different episodes to the story of Joan of Arc, which is crazy because when you think about it, she was a teenage illiterate female peasant in you know in France at a time when if you are a teenage illiterate female peasant, your options are about next to zero, and she decided that you know God has spoken to her and it's her mission to lead the armies of France to free Orleans, to kick out the English from big chunks of France and to have the what she considered the legitimate king of France crowned. And I mean, it's like complete pipe dream, right? There's no way you could, if you were the toughest military commander with a great reputation and 30,000 soldiers under you, maybe, maybe, difficult, but maybe, if you are a teenage illiterate female peasant, you have zero chances of making it happen. And yet it does happen. Like everything that she set herself out to do actually end up turning out exactly as she predicted, which is one of the things that if we didn't have really solid sources for this story, would it think it's complete fiction? Because it's just unbelievable. There's no way you can pull that off. You know, the odds of pulling that off are like one in 10 million. And somehow it happens. And it changes the destiny of the Hundred Years' War. It changes the destiny of the interaction between England and France. It changes everything because of what this one person of extremely humble origins pull off. In France, she still is um, almost uh, a saint. Well, actually, she is a saint. And, uh, and she's revered as, uh, as uh, one of the key founding personalities of, of the country. It's, uh, and it's can, an incredible story. Uh, yeah, you can see the same stuff because, you know, when you think about it from a purely rational standpoint, you're like, okay, there's no way you can pull that off. So, you know, I can see why people would run with the whole, oh, maybe she was talking to spirits. Maybe there was, a, you know, because rationally, again, that story makes yeah. no sense. So the fact that it did happen make you go, Ah, okay. <laughs> you know, that's an interesting one. It's uh, it's fascinating. There was um, there were many movies done about uh, about Joan of Arc, of course. Um, and since I, I, I like movies, in fact, the one that was done by um, uh, Besson uh, mm -hmm. with Mila Jovovich, I think, um, sure. had some interesting dialogues in the end where you don't you 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 guess is she talking to God or is she talking to some some delusional sure. imaginary friend in her head. And, um, Nobody. and of course you can't say, but what is interesting is that at those times, people would believe such a thing. And, uh, oh, yeah. and it leads to the fact that if a culture strongly believes a dogma, whatever it is, a religious sure. structure, yeah. um, if you are the right person at the right time that plays into that dogma, whether it's willingly or or cunningly, or or just because it's a it's a synchronicity or, or um, uh, yeah. chance. Well, then it can it can it can work. Like for example, Napoleon, mm -hmm. uh, had he been born ten years before, he right. would he would have simply been an artillery officer for the king's army. Had he sure. been born ten years later. Uh, he would have been, um, who knows, um, you know, France would not have been an empire. And, uh, and, and so sure. he would not, not, not have been Napoleon. He would have still been a sure. lieutenant or, or a brilliant artillery sure. um, young uh, officer of the Bonaparte, a uh, Corsican uh -huh. officer. But because he was at the right time and he had the ambition and he was given orders to, to quell, uh, to shoot on people basically in the street, and he did it. Then suddenly he got the political, you know, backing, and so that his talent as a genius uh, tactician and, and, and general could could happen. And then he invaded and conquered Italy, Egypt, and, and Germany, and 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 it's an interesting thing that sometimes the, the window of opportunity for certain personalities it makes it happen, and sometimes it just doesn't work. Absolutely. And that's what's interesting is that intermix between the larger context, the individual quirkiness of one person, the just random luck. 
self belief because you know in the, like you mentioned the John of Arc story you know if you take the more rationalist viewpoint and assume that she no she wasn't talking to some god or spirits or whatever well that's still a crazy wild story because that means just by by sure willpower by just her believing that she was doing this thing she pulled off stuff that was next to impossible so either way it's a, it's incredible you know but let's and, say uh, if my if my teenage daughter comes home saying I met some I talked to God in the forest and he yeah. wants me to to free friends from the muslims because today that's that's what right. what uh, someone who talks to sure. crazy christian god uh, yeah. would tell me I would send her to a doctor yeah of course <laughs> no, I mean, in fact there is the whole debate you know the most obvious explanation for the John of Arc thing is that she was crazy except that everything she set out to do and giving these impossible goals, they all happen. And so it makes you go, okay, maybe she was crazy, but then how does this stuff work? And, you know, and of course you don't know, and that's what's funny about that story. Yeah. You know, Everybody wants a conclusion. They either have the believer conclusion of like, no, she was really talking to God, the unbeliever trying to make the argument and no, clearly she was crazy. And the fact is nobody knows. And so people want answers because it's such a tantalizing mystery. But at the end of the day, it remains a mystery. You know, you just have to embrace it all and go like, who knows? But that's as wild as a tale as it gets. So young people today, to learn history, uh, as you said, they need the storytelling. They need something that links, you know, you know if, you say to a, if you say to a young, young man of 20 that indeed Caravaggio is like um, the current, well, of course, probably young people sure. don't know Tupac today, but... Uh, they would know. They would know the current guy that I don't know, <laughs> and and uh, and uh, maybe your daughter or my children know, but uh, I have no idea. And you tell them, well, he's like this guy today, or if you say to someone, well, look, uh, the emperor, uh, you know, Henry V, uh, sure. was like uh, Donald Trump to, of the time in England. Yeah. Then yeah. people they can imagine, they can think, and then you add the details. And I think yeah. you, you do that pretty well in your show, and and really I encourage the people who, who watch us to to connect to it. It's um, it's really a great thing. Yeah, I think it's important to uh, bring back something that people can relate to. Because ultimately the goal is people need to relate to something. Otherwise they won't care. So you do what you need to do to make sure that they do. So whether it's a kind of like psychologically trying to picture you in a certain situation in front of certain choices, how you would react, or by making pop culture reference or contemporary references that one is able to say, oh, I can see this, so I can picture it in the past. Or, you know, a bunch of different techniques to accomplish it. But ultimately, the goal is to, you know, nobody's going to learn if they are not entertained. So you need to be entertaining while you are teaching something. So, yeah, you want to do accurate history, of course. You want to tell the stuff exactly as it was. You're not fictionalizing it. But it needs to be entertaining. If it's not entertaining, I mean, there are sometimes stories that I'm like, oh, that would be a great story. But if I don't have any characters there, you know, it's just a big event with no particular character. And the event is maybe a little chop in the storytelling. Th then there's no way for me to do it because it's not going to fit that. You know, like, for example, there was a topic that maybe I'll do one day, but it's very difficult. Like, you know, the, during the gold rush, in California in, uh, starting in 1849 and in the following years. There's the major genocide of California Indian tribes. You know, the word genocide is not. There's uh, many cases of European native interaction for non genocide. Uh, there's a bit of feedback. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. So there are a lot of interactions between Europeans and natives that are not genocide. Uh, the one that happens in California definitely is genocide. You know, it's pretty textbook uh, definition of it. So it's because many people don't know it. It's interesting as a tale to tell. Hey, there was actual genocide in a place like California just not even two centuries ago, probably a century and a half ago. But I have no characters. It's a depressing story. Yes. There's much of an arc. It's very hard to tell it in a compelling way to make people want to relate. Most of the stories that I tell need to have characters in them, need to have individuals, because, you know, if you read the statistics, nobody cares. You need to care about the individuals involved for yes. people to care. If I don't, same thing, a lot of African history, which would be fascinating to dive in, 
there are either not very reliable sources, and so you're going into the realm of mythology, yes. or there are important tales with no characters, where it's like, oh, and then this kingdom did this. It's like, yeah, but if I don't see the people, if I don't have individuals there, it's very hard to, to yeah, tell yeah, a story. Yeah. It's true. You have Zulu, you have Shaka Zulu, which is uh, yeah, yeah. pretty but documented, that's... and you have the emperor, one of the emperors of Mali, who did some crazy uh, trip to Mecca, uh, yeah. destroying the economies of, of all the countries he was going through because he was giving so much gold around. Uh, that's an interesting no, I mean, one. You know, you have some of those, definitely, but they are few and far between. Yeah. And, uh, you know, anytime you're, you don't have those characters, you're kind of stuck sometimes. Yeah. The um, interesting also about history is that you, if you don't understand where you're coming from, you don't understand where you're going. Sure. And um, maybe to, to switch topic for just a second, how is it going in the in the U.S. right now? Is it, um, I mean, the, the culture is changing. I mean, from, from the Internet and the media, obviously we see the crazy things. But from the day-to-day -day living, as you are in, uh, and also because you have a, you have a young, still young daughter, uh, sure. so you have, the, you have the impact from school and, and what she's learning and so on. How, how is the culture evolving in, in, in Los Angeles, and California, in the U.S.? Well, I mean, I think this is uh, even more than just LA, California. It's kind of a global thing. The fact that people, the rate of transformation is so much faster than anything that has ever happened in human history. Just in terms of technology, the kind of technological changes over the last few years are dramatic. In terms of so many other aspects, that. People are either both excited and overwhelmed. You know, on one end is very exciting, the kind of things that we can do today that even just 20 years ago seemed uh, impossible to even conceive of. And at the same time, there's so much. There's such... Uh, many people are feeling like the rug is being pulled under their feet and they can't quite orient themselves in a way. I mean, think about even something as pervasive as social media. It dominates most people's lives. It's such a central part of most people's daily okay. existence, and yet you, we don't really know what to do. Like, we haven't really figured out how to take the good of it without all the crap that goes with it. And so, you know, there are a lot of these things happening where we are kind of grappling, trying to come to terms with all the new tools that we have at our disposal. And at the same time, just as we are trying to figure out what do I do with these 100 new tools that exist in my life, there's a thousand more being dumped in. And so it's like, oh my God, how do I? So I think we're at a very interesting historical juncture because there's nothing like this before in human history. You know, the speed of transformation at which this is happening is insanely fast and it's not slowing down. So it's interesting as far as where that's going to go. And I don't think there are too many, I don't think... It, Usually you can use history to predict the future. This is a very difficult case because there's nothing in history quite like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How is your MMA uh, story going? I train, but I'm, um, yeah, I'm 45. I want to relax. Still so strong. I saw the picture. You're still strong for 45. I'm 47 and struggling. So, yeah, yeah. it's good. It's good. It's good. Well, look, Daniele, thank you very much. Um, sure. I will put the link again of uh, both your um, your new uh, channel where your content sure. is going to be, as well as uh, History on Fire and the Drunken Taoist. I encourage everyone who's listening, Société uh, Italiane, or si vous êtes français, or, 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 or um, I was trying to fake German, but I, I really don't know it very well, uh, to, to get on it and listen to it. It's worth You will learn English as well. With the Italian, you can learn English with an Italian accent, which is great right. for the ladies. It's great for the girls. So, so thank you very much, and uh, and uh, we should meet one day in California, or if you come to Italy, let me know. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll have we'll have something. Thanks a lot. Beautiful.